Welcome to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Scott, and together we will dive into the lives and careers of the jazz legends who have left a rhythmic imprint on the world. Be prepared to reminisce on the highs and the lows of their musical journey and the trials that sculpted their timeless musical gems. We'll preserve the legacy of these extraordinary maestros and find inspiration in the melodies of their lives. Subscribe now and never miss a beat. Now, let's get to the show. Our guest today is a saxophonist who shared the stage with the late George Duke, Marcus Miller, Kirk Whalem, Najee, and that's just to name a few. If you haven't heard of him, you need to listen to Baby Soul, Touch, Evolve, and that's just to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome to Jazz Flight, the podcast, Mr. Jakeem Joyner. Jakeem, welcome. Hey, what's going on, Daryl? <laughs> Dude, I am, I'm, I'm honored that you are participating in this show. I, I, I really do, because I think... You have a tremendous talent and you have a a style, which we'll get to in a few minutes, that just is, it's easy, it's calming. There's a coolness to it, which I, I really appreciate. But first of all, when did you first pick up the sax and why? Wow. <laughs> um, I picked up the sax at the age of 14 in high school. Mm -hmm. um, the why um, actually, it wasn't my first choice of an instrument because I wanted to play drums for the high school band. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, they didn't have, um, they had too many drummers. They had five drummers, I believe. And they told me I needed to, uh, the music teacher told me I needed to try something else. <laughs> 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 so, you know, it was interesting because they took me to this big band closet and I saw all these other instruments, trombone, trumpet, tuba, flute. And I saw the saxophone, which was kind of intriguing. It looked, it looked complicated. It looked challenging. It looked expensive. And I just said, Hey, just show me how to play that. And he gave me a tape and uh, on the tape was Grover Washington Jr., Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, Cannonball, and a lot of other artists, I didn't have any idea who they were at the age of 14, but I started listening. <laughs> nice. And, and we are very happy that you have chosen the saxophone. I want to come back to those influences in a minute. But as a youngster, you, you know, you started out playing, but then it seems as though in high school you matured because at one point you were the, you were the musical director for the Harvest Outreach Ministries in Newport News. How do you go from a high school saxophonist to all of a sudden being the musical conductor for, for an organization like that? Yeah, well, you know, I started singing in church before I started playing the saxophone or the drums. So um, I moved back down to Virginia. I'm from Norfolk, Virginia. I started playing sax and grew up in Syracuse, New York. Um, but I moved back down to Virginia after graduating high school and I hooked back up with my pastor, um, Michael Patterson where I uh, started, where that's where I started my music was at his church, actually. And he needed a music director. And I had already, you know, had four years in high school. I was playing keyboards and he wanted me to, you know, be the director for the uh, music department. And I took it on. And that's where I started picking up a lot of my skills as a keyboard player, piano player, and a, uh, you know, choir leader and things like that. So, yeah. So the saxophone is not the only thing you play. What else do you play? I play piano and flute. Um, I tried to play a little trumpet, but that didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and, and you also had the opportunity to spend some time in Nigeria, the Sudan, and Kenya. Can you describe that experience? Well, you know, I've been back and forth to Africa many times throughout my career um, as a performing artist. But the very first time was uh, with my pastor who took me there to, uh, to Africa at the age of I think I was 20, I believe. Uh, yeah, so, um, and it was, that that experience, it's really hard to explain that experience. I mean, just imagine a 20-year-old never leaving the country, barely got his passport, right. and the first place he goes to is Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at 20, I mean, 
all of the things that came to me at that time, I couldn't explain. I mean, the people on the street, the people that met us, the people that helped us, the, the uh, hotels that we stayed in, the food that we ate, just a different culture. Uh, it's, it was just so much to take in at the age of 20. And then, you know, we stayed in Nigeria, um, in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, and then we went over to Wari, Nigeria, um, to spend some time. My pastor was preaching and he built some churches over there. And then we went over to uh, Southern Sudan, where I was able to um, put my hand in the Nile, the Nile River. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, it was no electricity. I stayed in a little kind of a hut thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that inside that hut was one mosquito. And let me tell you, the power of one mosquito, <laughs> Man. trust me, <laughs> but uh, it was an amazing thing. You know, I played the sax with no, um, no, it was no sound system or nothing like that, but it was a bunch of kids and people, village people that I played to. So it was a really amazing experience. I remember seeing two eagles um, mm-hmm. standing on a post outside of the village and they were huge. I had never seen eagles that and they and that size and they looked at me with with their eyes it just seemed like it was so much intelligence and i (laughs) you know (laughs) it's funny when you kind of get outside of your zone and you see stuff like that i'm always amazed at animals i just am for some Mm -hmm. silly reason but but eagles is one of those things uh those and hawks and peregrine falcons and all that sort of stuff you you stand there and you're in shock and then it's like you know what they could attack me. I think I'm going to move. Um, <laughs> so it seems in the short time that we've talked, you were far more mature for your age to handle this. Where does mm-hmm. that maturity come from? Wow. You know, um, you know, I worked a full-time job pretty much halfway through high school. Um, I started actually, uh, I got my own apartment uh, while in high school. Wow. Not, and I had my own apartment when I graduated high school. So I had, you know, the, the real world was kind of pushed on me at an early age. You know, I had to graduate. I had to pay rent, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, at 16. So I had no choice but to be responsible. And, you know, I guess my pastor saw that in me. And, you know, out of all the deacons that he could have taken and out of all of the assistant pastors that he could have taken, uh, he decided that he wanted me to go with him. Uh, on his missionary trip to Africa. Wow, that that is very impressive. You mentioned earlier some of your, well, you got the the CD or whatever, and it had Charlie Parker and Grover Washington Jr. Who are your influences with the saxophone? The, that, there you go, right there, Grover Washington Jr., Charlie Parker, John Coltrane. I uh, I started off listening to more of the straight ahead sound mm-hmm. until I heard uh, Gerald Albright on the radio playing My, My, My. Mm-hmm. And that kind of sent me on a new direction of saxophone players. And from there, I started to listen to Najee, who was a big influence uh, during my high school years. And then also um, Kirk Whalum. Uh, mm-hmm. I started, I heard about Kirk Whalum and then uh, Boney James. And so I started to move into this contemporary R&B pop side, uh, you know, halfway through high school. It was very interesting how that happened. What did you take from all of those gentlemen, all those tremendous sax players that you have incorporated into your style? Well, you know, I mean, it, it took a while for me to really get my own sound, honestly. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I was, you know, I, I I listened to Kenny G. I listened a lot to Gerald Albright. I listened a lot to Kirk Willem. I would learn all of their songs. I remember even um, Rick Braun was playing with uh, Boney James and um, I can't remember the name of that album, but I played a lot of this stuff from it. It's, this is back in the 90s. So mm-hmm. um, I wish I knew the name of that album. But I learned a lot of that stuff. And honestly, you know, I would just hear these artists playing through me as a player. And eventually I would uh, just find my own sound, find my own tone just after years of practicing and playing. And then sometimes I would go uh, a season without listening to anyone except for myself Mm -hmm. and hearing myself play. And then eventually I came up with a sound that now people, when they hear it, they know it's me. It is. It's interesting, and I'm always curious about the influences and how you incorporate all of that experience into your own style. What would you call your style right now? Wow. You know, I mean, it's very soulful. 
Um, it's uh, very passionate. You know, it, you can feel it. You know, that's the main thing about when I play. And the, most people will say that when they hear me play, they can feel it, which is what I want people to, you know, experience when they hear hear me play. But style wise, I'm totally into funk with R&B, you know, twist to it, a little bit of old school, you know. Um, but again, sometimes it depends on the song, too. I mean, I can go full on classical if I need to, um, <laughs> you know, so. Um, but it's, I guess it's really hard to put one type of style on it, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, but definitely uh, I would say soulful uplifting for sure. It is. And it truly is that you, you, you need to get the CDs. Um, and I don't know whether to call them CDs now or streaming music. I just, I'm just going <laughs> to CDs. That's what I'm going to do. When your first project came out, what was the feeling like? That's always it's like the first time you hear your voice, you're like, that's not me. Um, but in a musician's case, you have practiced and rehearsed and done several takes of a song. Now it's, it's out there and it's available for us to realize and us to hear. Can you describe mm -hmm. that overall feeling? Yeah. Well, you know, my very first CD that uh, went out national is baby soul. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's uh, 2007. Um, the first single from that uh, album is a song called Stay With Me Tonight, which features Peter White. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing that on 94.7 The Wave, Los Angeles. Uh, this was the first time I heard my music on the radio ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that song was playing on the radio. And it's like, wow, I couldn't believe that everyone in Los Angeles right now in the Los Angeles area is listening to my song. So it was, it was kind of a surreal moment, you know, it's like, wow, I guess I've made it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I saw somewhere where you have a musician's clinic. You invite a bunch of kids in from high school. Are you still doing that? Uh, well, you know, I did a lot of um, high school tours where I would actually go to schools and do clinics uh, mm -hmm. for high schools. Um, and just talk to students about the music business. I created an actual course, though, where people can actually download uh, just different things that I come up came up with on, you know, how to make it in the industry, how to master your sound and playing and different things like that, that people can actually go and download or uh, subscribe to. So, um, you know, I, it's education. I love to be able to, you know, share knowledge of what I know and, uh, you know, inspire young people and people to, you know, follow the path that I did. Well, tell people how, how they can get it, where it's available. Every, everything you can go, just go to my website, jackingjoiner.com. Okay. You can even search. So cool. Yeah. You you are, th this is, it's good to me because like I said, I, I have an affinity for, for saxophone players and you right now are on that list. It is very tough, I would guess, to constantly come up with music and titles what is your inspiration to do these songs and create these songs? You know, I mean, the inspiration comes from a lot of different places. You know, it could come from life experiences. Um, a lot of times it can come from just listening to artists, your favorite artists, and you know, you're not even in a musical mood, but a song comes on that just really resonates with you. And if you are creative like me, you're starting to think, how can I translate this feeling into my own song? and deliver it to an audience, you know? So um, uh, a lot of my music, you know, people might not know this, but they just come from a lot of different things, different experiences. Each album has a certain story to it, you know, and a time in my life, you know, that it, they, they have meaning, you know, believe it or not. Um, but when it comes to writing a song and, and finding that, that hook, <laughs> mm -hmm, you know, so to speak, right. and just really coming up with the right melodies and tones for the song, you know, when well, you've got that inspiration that's coming from someone like Stevie Wonder or Michael Jackson, and you just hear how they put so much passion and energy into their music, and into their songs and into their lyrics, you know, you, you find that as a saxophone player like myself, I'm always uh, asking, you know, how can I put that same type of passion and energy into my own songs, you know, um, so that people can feel it, you know, in the heart. The, the, the other thing is, I'm just going to say this, you're young. You are. 
<laughs> in, in my world, you're young. Okay. And you've been at this game 20 years. Yeah. How, how does it feel to be a 20 year vet? Now, that when you say it that way, it seems like a long time, but you're yeah. not necessarily putting out a product every other month. You know, you're kind of taking your time and you have mm -hmm. such a following. Um, your music is so good. What, how do you do, how do you maintain that? How do you deal with that pressure? You know, I mean, I always say if you really love what you do and mm -hmm. you really have a passion for playing the saxophone, you know, all of that hard stuff, you know, that, that stuff is just secondary. You just kind of go through and just go blow right past that stuff because your passion and your love for your music kind of conquers all of that stuff. You know, it's just in the end, no matter what happens to the industry, it's not going to change my love for playing my own. Mm -hmm. And you play that horn oh so well. All right. This is one thing I discovered in doing my research. I know about the sax play and I, I saw the, the clinics that you create. Tell me about this author thing. And You've got three books out, if I stand corrected. Uh, mm -hmm. Help me with this first one. Zara, Send Us Final Hope. Second Zaria, one. yeah. Zaria, mm -hmm. Minor, Minor Assassin, and Time Minor Lab. Assassin. Time Lab. And also, I just released my uh, um, um, Zarya episode two last week, um, uh, Sochi Unleashed. So that just came out. So when when do you have time to write books? <laughs> you know, it's not about like um, finding time. It's more about managing time mm -hmm. okay <laughs> really um you know when you get into a routine like i i forced to, myself to create a routine um I, I would have not finished the first book had i not had a routine that says no matter what you're going to write for five minutes every day <laughs> you know and that's how the first book came was just being very consistent at writing every day and it turns out I actually love doing it, <laughs> you know? And uh, so, you know, I'm more, I'm most creative in the morning time. So most of my writing, songwriting or literature is done in the morning time because my mind is fresh or late in the evening. That's when, uh, for some reason, the juices are flowing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just as long as you stay consistent, um, pushing, doing the same thing and, and keep hammering at the same thing, in the end, you're going to build something. All right. Now, if I understand correctly, you have four books, mm -hmm. but they're all different. It's all like a different subject matter. It's a different. It's just different. Well, all... um, uh, well, yeah. So Zarya episode one and two, they're the same story. Just the mm -hmm. story continued. Minor Assassin is different because while Zarya is more of a futuristic Star Wars, Avatar versus uh, the Virgin series, teenage girl saves the world on a new planet with flying speeders and things like that and all this technology. Minor Assassin is different where it's more real world, where it's, um, it's, uh, it's fiction, of course, um, but it's martial arts, it's crime, it's thriller. We're dealing with real um, detectives, real police officers, real events, real life events that are happening. So it's not fake. It's more of a mystery. And Minor Assassin is a teenager who wants to um, get revenge on those who, um, a, a very bad Chinese gang that um, did some harm to his family. And he goes to Japan. It has a little bit of a karate kid feel to it in the sense that he goes to Japan and learns how to fight, but also learns how to use uh, lots of weapons and technical weapons and things. He comes back to Las Vegas and he wants to get revenge. Um, the good thing for him is um, while he's taking out the bad dudes, he's taking out the bad dudes that the um, detectives are looking for to arrest anyway. So he's just getting to them first. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow you're mixing, you mentioned the song title, Beautiful Seduction with a minor assassin and Zaria. How do you learn to separate? I mean, I can't, I have a, I struggle with two thoughts at the same time. Um, <laughs> I get the, you, you've got to have a regiment, you've got to have a discipline, but how do you separate the music from the literature? 
it's not easy, um, especially if you go straight from producing music right into writing. It's 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 a complicated transition, believe it or not, um, which I didn't think it would be. You could have all the time in the world, but when you put in a lot of energy in music and then now it's time to write, it's really hard to get into the groove of it. Um, so sometimes you have to come back maybe an hour or two later. Um, but I, I feel that uh, writing music and writing lit literature kind of feels the same in a sense that I'm creating something brand new. I get to use my imagination to create whatever it is that I want um, and just be free, really. I think it's just a freeing experience writing. You get to be the, uh, the god of the entire story. Whatever you want to happen has to happen. But you you get to uh, use the same discipline that you use when writing songs to make the literature make sense, you know, make the story make sense, put it all together, you know, from the beginning to the end. So, um, but you know, I've, I'm finding more ways on how to transition, um, you know, from either writing to doing music or from doing music to writing because it's uh, it's 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 challenging mentally to to click on the next one you know mm -hmm. so sometimes if you go for a walk or do some uh, uh working out or something like that you can get into the groove into the next thing so <laughs> all right i'm, I'm going to speak fut futuristically over the next 20 years when one of the books becomes a movie mm -hmm. and you get to direct and produce are you also going to do the soundtrack <laughs> i would love to actually um, I like producing and composing music that's, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of music that I have that a lot of people haven't heard um, where I'm actually producing music and composing music where I'm using orchestral elements and different things that you might hear on the movie soundtrack. Um, I'm a big fan of people like Hans Zimmer, Steve Jablonski, John Powell. These are the, um, these are the titans for uh, film music production. <laughs> and mm -hmm. trailers, you know, whether it's for movies like the Transformers or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, or The Rock, you know, these guys are at the top of their game in that. And I follow and listen to their music. I, I'm just sitting here trying to figure out when do you have time to do all of this stuff? And it's all very, very good. Um, Thank you. I, 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 now, granted, I haven't read the books, but I do. I'm, I will order. I'm trying to figure which one. To, if you had to say, of the four, which one's the best book? Well, I mean, they're different. It all depends on what type of style do you like. Do you like futuristic Star Wars Avatar stuff, or do you like more of um, Expendables, like from um, you know uh, Denzel Washington? If you like Expend Expendables and you like mystery thriller um, fighting, then that's going to be Minor Assassin. Okay. I might have to get that one. That that'll be that that'll be interesting. <laughs> yeah. You you are a I don't know if interesting is the right word, but you are a your enthusiasm, first of all, is is wonderful. The fact that you, you do all of these things is more wonderful. For me, in this conversation that we're having, you are a person I think more young people need to see and hear about not just the music but the books and everything because of your energy your your ability to i'll just say separate music to literature and you you seem to have this totally creative mind um that's the other thing where does this creativity come from because i, I would think music is you know kind of bob your head and, and listen and find that groove while a book is more I need to put this down. I need to get from point A to point B. And that might be a page. It might be 10 pages. Mm -hmm. How, eh, what do you do? <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's, I didn't see myself becoming an author. I didn't think that I would become an author. I know that I've, I love movies. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I grew up going into the movies. I grew up sneaking into the movies actually. Okay. <laughs> when I was uh, younger, like nine, 10, we used to sneak into movies all the time, but I love the movies. Um, but I love stories, you know? And um, I decided that once I figured out that I could create my own story with the first book, Zarya, I think that was it for me. I was like, this is, a, this is home. <laughs> Writing stories is, is just as much as home as it is with uh, music, believe it or not. Um, I, you know, I found a passion doing that. When did, when did you start and, and complete Zaria? 
Uh, oh, gosh, when did I start? Uh, yeah, honestly, Zarya was about a four-year project. I started it in 2012, I believe. Um, and I finished it in about 2015, somewhere around there. So it was a really long project. Uh, it took a, it takes a long time to get everything together and rewrite and rehash. You got to keep at it you know, to finish an entire book. Minor Assassin took about two years uh, mm -hmm. to finish. Um, and Zarya Episode 2, which is out now, that took a little under a year, probably closer to six months. So obviously I'm getting faster. Right. So was a music career started before being an author? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because I, yeah, because I, you know, I started Baby Soul came out 2007. So, okay. and then Zarya came out 2014 or 2015. So, uh, yeah. Just <laughs> cranking it out, man. So, which one is closer to your heart? The music or the literature? Honestly, they both are close to my music is inside of my bones. You know, it's it's running through my veins. It's in every single thing that I do. You know, music is always there. Um, but literature allows me to use my imagination in another way and put out, you know, more creative aspects about myself, you know. So um, it's, it's it's a freeing thing, honestly, believe it or not. I, I wouldn't give one over the other because they're, two different creative spaces honestly mm -hmm. and it's hard to say i love one over the other because when i'm in music i'm in totally in love with it and, and creating the songs and i go through the same issues when it's uh, um, when it comes to writing stories where, where in music you're like fighting through a song and it's not working and the melody is not working or you're trying to figure out how can i get this verse to sound the way that it should it's the same way when it comes to writing stories it's like man it's ah, i just do not like the way this chapter sounds you know so but it, it's a it's a it's a it's a love thing you know it's like even though it's complicated even though it's hard you're doing it because you know you love doing it you know? so it's not like it, you know, it's not like i'm i'm getting rich writing uh, stories or books or anything like that so <laughs> yeah, right. that makes sense so <laughs> With all this time that you are doing work, what do you do to relax? What do you do to decompress? What do you do to escape? You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I always go to the gym and then the gym after doing the gym, it definitely relaxes me. You know, um, I, I sometimes I will travel out of town, even if I'm not uh, doing any gigs to visit some of my favorite cities and different things like that. I and mean, I just got back from San Francisco. I went up there to see some friends just to just to hang out and um, so in, you know, anytime I'm not working on music or not writing, I could, you know, be enjoying my favorite movies, you know, I'd love to take my daughter to different places. I think we went to Disneyland two or three times already this year. Mm -hmm. Um, and she, she also comes with me to some of my shows as well. But, um, so, I mean, you know, I, I, I would say I'm, I'm pretty busy <laughs> for the most part and I'm an yeah. adventurous as well. So I don't like to sit at home. You know, I like to explore. You know, I love nature. <laughs> What's the most adventurous thing you've ever done? The most adventurous thing that I've ever done um, might have been an experience um, uh, getting lost in Japan, actually, uh, before a show. <laughs> I was in uh -huh. Japan in, to in Tokyo, and um, I caught one of the trains. They call it the Yamanoto line. Which goes around, it goes in a circle around Tokyo, dropping you off at the various districts like Shibuya, Shinjuku, Harajuku, Electric Town, all of these different places. And I got off on one station, which was like a business district station. I just jumped off just because I'm like, why not? Right. <laughs> and then, but I couldn't find my way back to the train station. And I had a ah. gig that night with Keiko Matsui. So that was very adventurous because I was going, uh, uh, knocking on the windows of the taxis drivers um and none of them could speak english oh, oh. <laughs> so that was yeah so i was like wow so i'm like this i'm like lost now because i not, i don't speak japanese i mean at least not that much at that time right. so yeah it was quite the did, experience did you make it to the <laughs> show on time barely i think i i made it to the show exactly on time <laughs> like oh. right at the downbeat um, because one of the taxi drivers had a, a flyer in there uh, for our performance at the Blue Note with Keiko Matsui. So um, he was able to find it and drive me 
<laughs> to the blue note. <laughs> that's the so, luck of Jakeem. That sounds that's that's interesting. I don't know how you would do that. So, yeah. so you got all this out. Now you have the new book out. When is new music coming out? So right now, just uh, it's today and pretty much all this summer, I'm working on a new album for next year. Missing mm-hmm. You, the, the single from that album, that was the number one song, um, which was unexpected. But uh, so that's going to be on the new album. And we're looking at February, March uh, of next year for the new album. So I'm working on that diligently every day right now so i can't wait to get you guys this new sound i don't want to give away what i'm bringing but i will say i think you're gonna love it is it is it special because the missing you is not your first number one you've had several is -hmm. the experience different every time you reach that point and do you have expectations for it to be number one or do you just go i have no expectations we're going to see what happens no expectations at all. Um, my first single that went number one, um, I'm Waiting For You, that was like track number nine on the album. I had no clue that people would even be interested in that for radio. It turns out that that was a pretty big hit for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it was number one for 12 weeks on the billboard. Right. And then um, the opening track to the album, Take Me There, uh, that was the second single. That also went number um so it's like when you when you are number one and it's been several weeks then you're like it's it's like it's like a novelty it's like i'm supposed to be number one but then when you go number one again it's like wow i can't believe that happened again it's like a whole new experience the same thing with dismissing you when that went number one i was like wow i couldn't believe it um i mean you know you always put a you know, all of your energy and everything you can in the song. You don't know what it's going to do. You hope it does well. But when it goes to number one, you're like, wow, this is, you know, this is a great feeling. And and it's, it's, a, it's a great feeling that radio stations across the country are resonating with music that you create. Well, pat yourself on the back for that one. thing you do some things with kids we've talked about that you have an opportunity right now to give us some advice for kids or for people who want to play music or for people who want to be authors and do everything that you do what advice would you give them you know do it for the love of doing it not for money and not for attention you know do it because you love it It, some people are doing things that they don't even really want to do Um, you should find what you really want to do and spend time doing that um you could be playing the wrong instrument like maybe you're supposed to be playing drums maybe you're supposed to be playing bass maybe you're supposed to be playing sax and maybe that's where you'll find that passion and love to uh do something that you you love doing Um, and if you can turn that into a business that's the best thing to have a business doing something that you love you pretty much want it the game of life (laughs) <laughs> one more time before we go give us the website um where people can get books music so forth and so on so you want to follow me at jackie joiner um a lot of people don't know how to spell my name but it's j-a-c-k-i-e-m-j-o-y-n-e-r um follow me on instagram there also on facebook and my website jackie you can connect to um, everything, whether it's my literature, music, courses, it's all there. I thank you so much for the time. I have learned so much. You are, you're, you're an inspiration and I hope people get that. I hope people understand <laughs> everything that you're doing and why you're doing it because you're doing everything for all the right reason. Um, thank you. Keep, keep doing what you're doing, man. This is, this. <laughs> you are talented by leaps and bounds and, and, yeah. Right now, you're you're my top five saxophonist, um, and, I, and I mean <laughs> that. But don't get me wrong, you're competing with Kirk Whalem, too. Um, <laughs> I love Kirk. Yeah, he's I, my top saxophonist. <laughs> One I of my tops. He's right up there, yeah. I can't reach the, the poster I got of him. I had a chance to interview him many, many years ago um, mm-hmm. and, and actually trying to get a hold of him for this show. Great, greatly appreciate it. Best of luck to you. Keep doing what you're doing. 
uh, appreciate you being on the show and and maybe when that new project comes out we'll we'll get back together we can talk nothing about just the new project yes 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 you'll be one of the first to get it daryl so thanks oh, man i appreciate I, the invitation you realize this show is recorded okay so what you just <laughs> said i'm gonna hold you too and like i said when you come to cleveland let us know um i think okay. people want to see you uh Granted, I've cheated and watched some stuff on, on, on YouTube and stuff like that, but it's it's a, it's always a different dynamic when you can see the yeah. person in person, see the person in person. Thank you again, okay. folks. Thank you. You've heard a wonderful <laughs> young man here. If you go out, go get all his stuff. It is all very good. Thank you for listening to the Jazz Flight Podcast. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for tuning in to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I hope you enjoy the stories and soulful melodies that grew through the doors of time. If you want to stay connected with the latest updates and episodes, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. Until next time, I'm Daryl Scott.